Okay, since Feld is outside, I'll do introduction. This is Joel Serrell uh, from OAR, the expert in RTEMS. So, take it away. So I've realized looking back that I've used something very close to this title like three or four times over the years. And I've given presentations like this often enough where sometimes I, now I don't know what you might or might not have seen. So stop me and ask questions because a lot has been going on in the RTEMS world. Um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about, but we're not gonna talk about what we're gonna talk about. The first question everybody asked, I think Daniel said he had been pegged on this like three or four times in the past couple of weeks was, why did we change the numbering? Because all the stuff has been numbered 4.12 for like a year, and then all of a sudden we decided to go to five. Well, the answer is really simple. If, if you've noticed a trend away from three digit software version numberings to two digit and one digit, the reason is because nobody ever changes the first digit. You realize two years after you should have changed it that you should have changed it. So over the history of four, we should have changed it twice. This should be the third time that it was incremented. So we're gonna follow like the GCC scheme. The next release will be 5.1 and after, so 5.1 is logically gonna be equivalent to 4.12.0 in the old no numbering scheme. So the other thing is we, it just encourages us uh, to, to update numbering. So we'll go from five to six. The other, that's pretty much it for that one. There have been a lot of, of things that have improved. So the big change from five, which I will often randomly still call 4.12, from 4.11 is 4.11 was the first release with symmetric multiprocessing. Between 4.11 and now, there's been a tremendous effort to optimize, uh, increase scalability, uh, to improve in performance and address some long-term issues. We fully expect this 5.1 to be what we're jokingly referring to as a 10-year release. There are a lot of, uh, European Space Agency is still using a derivative of 4.8, which is really old, and we expect this will be the next version that they will in, do pre-qualification efforts on. Um, so we are anticipating having to live with this version for a long time, so we're trying to be very conscious of it being w that way when it comes out. So if you notice, there's um, a lot of things which are easy to look over. Uh, now we've, we've had a focus for the past few years on what we call reproducibility, and that means you build everything, including the tools from source. You can put the source code for every line of code on the target and the tools under configuration control with now SHA 512 checksums right from day one. That's our, uh, something we learned from MMS that, that uh, was nice to let them be able to build from source. The second thing is that system initializations via constructors, this dropped out all the dead code that came in as a result of, um, of having to initialize all of the classes of objects that you, now you don't need. Uh, POSIX, because of this now, POSIX imposes no overhead and it's enabled by default. It also has things that are necessary for symmetric multiprocessing applications. Um, an invisible change is that uh, formerly SIGWIN and RTEMS had POSIX header files of their own, even though we both use the same C library. Now we have pretty much unified POSIX header files between FreeBSD, RTEMS, and SIGWIN, and the header files are in NewLib. There's been an increased emphasis on POSIX conformance, including the guards that if you see in a, in a POSIX man page, it says this is only there like if this pound define is done, RTEMS uh, should, and SIGWIN both should be much more conformant on that. Uh, one of the things we're really, we finally, 64-bit uh, time T is on by default now, so 2038 isn't a problem, which given a launch date, now we're talking 2025, uh, we've got commercial applications, which we know now are being fielded with lifespans beyond that. So that was a necessary and long overdue thing. 64-bit PowerPC support just showed up. And at the same time, one of the cool things that showed up is uh, support for 10 gigabit Ethernet. So we got our first 10 gig E driver. It can do full uh, wire speed under certain configurations. So... Um, one of the interesting thing is uh, Netflix uses FreeBSD. We use the FreeBSD TCP IP stack. So indirectly, we're all getting Netflix sponsored optimization. So the world is not really big if you share with the right people. Uh, there's, uh, as part of increasing the scalability, we've gone to using balanced uh, 
binary trees, red-black trees in a lot of places internally. Now, uh, one of the things about that was on uh, symmetric multiprocessing, scalability was how many timer events fire at any particular clock tick. So now they have been distributed, they're, they're managed using a red-black tree, and the timers are distributed based on what core they were scheduled from, assuming that the thread that's interested in that timer is also on the same core. So if you're naturally spreading your threads out, the timers associating with them will naturally be distributed as a side effect. So that was a big thing. The other huge architectural change, so from 4.10 to 4.11, you went from a uniprocessor to support for SMP. From 4.11 to 5, we optimized and got rid of the big kernel lock. And that's a big um, issue for any operating system that's going to support symmetric multiprocessing. It's a huge optimization. It gets rid of a lot of resource contention, especially as the uh, scale goes up. Uh, there's benchmarks, I think I showed them last year on a 24 processor Q or IQ PowerPC where OpenMP scales linearly. As a, when you start do, getting into multi, uh, core symmetric multiprocessing and clustered scheduling, you need to also address how priority sealing and priority inheritance are done. There are protocols which are more aware of what's happening in uh, on a uniprocessor system, life was a lot simpler, and we could use simple priority inheritance and simple priority sealing. So we've got to go to these two algorithms, um, the uh, order in big O in independence preserving protocol for priority inheritance and multiprocessor uh, resource sharing protocol. Those are both fairly new. Uh, like I think one of them was only academically presented in like 2013, 2014. Did I do some type something wrong? No, I'm Uh, the, the first two are what's used in a uniprocessor configuration. So we've been very conscious of not adding any overhead in a uniprocessor configuration because you don't need it. That transitive priority inheritance, many of you have heard, uh, uh, I talked about priority inheritance recently. The transitive is, uh, takes into account both stepping up and stepping down as you lock, but it also keeps up with across multiple resources and long dependency chains which is a big improvement. So if you have 12 tasks and 24 mutexes and you get a huge dependency graph, the transitive tracks that. So that's a huge improvement in five for systems that are pretty complicated. I should have, to repeat this, we were very careful to keep things as simple as possible on uniprocessor while having extension points that change when you build for SMP. Uh, one of the other interesting things is a lot of things, not, there are some features which are not inherently not safe on symmetric multiprocessing systems. We have done one of two things. The first is if uh, some of those features have flat, were obsoleted, were deprecated in 4.11 and are now removed. There is guidance in the documentation now on what to replace those with. The other thing we've done is there are some features which simply are there in a uniprocessor configuration and are either not built or you'll get a runtime error if it's just an odd feature of a call. So we've tried to kind of slap you a little bit if you've done something which is not safe, but um, there's a lot in the documentation on things that aren't safe. I have probably used these, I may have used these same slide, this same slide last year because I want to remind everybody clustered scheduling is not, um, it's not something we're all normally familiar with. The idea is that you can run multiple instances of the thread scheduler and you can assign it to different subsets of cores. So this is the Leon 3 uh, standard block diagram. So what you've got is, and the nice thing about the Leon is it has very uniform uh, replication of the hardware resources. There's an integer unit, a floating point unit, a cache, and it's just replicated. So what we might want to do is uh, take the first processor and essentially treat it as a hard real-time, heavily analyzed I.O. and, and um, tight deadline rate monotonic processor so we can schedule it. We can run a regular priority-based scheduler on it. Uh, we might have, in this case, I guess I meant that first one's mainly I.O. The second one would be your critical rate monotonic task, periodic things. And the other two are just background workers doing like uh, video processing, that type of work. Um, so what you've done is run three separate thread schedulers 
which allows you to do normal uniprocessor analysis on the first two and then have two dedicated to workers. It also, by virtue of hopefully uh, containing and isolating the processing that's related, then you'll avoid having uh, data contention across the bus. So what we're really doing, this particular configuration of clustered scheduling, if the, thing, if the activities are assigned correctly, you will have focused your uh, scheduler configuration on predictability and analyzability, which is very important. So uh, looking at a GR740, which is a little more complicated, but actually it's essentially very similar since you're still replicating the four processors, we can do a different example of that. And uh, what we can do is uh, basically do an asymmetrical system where we're going to run multiple instances of RTIMS. And um, so we can run one app that's a three-core SMP application and still do the same thing. Core zero is, an, is uh, IO, and we're just going to have two cores for worker threads and then actually just flat run another R an RTIMS application on the other. And that could also have just been another operating system mixed in. The cluster scheduling also allows you to uh, restrict the RTEMS instance to um, a subset of cores, so you could mix operating systems on a set of cores. The GR740 also has a feature, which you can ask Daniel about, which allows you to bypass the cache for DMA transfers, so you can avoid cache con the, the I.O. Uh, causing cache contention problems. Um, and I, so the focus here was we again have schedulability issues, analyzability, predictability, but we're also, by uh, focusing on that IO MMU and that secondary pa bypass path, we can uh, actually avoid some CPU contention and hopefully help the caching be more predictable. Every time I do one of these, there's always a slide to highlight what was added and what was removed. The, um, the stuff that's cool that's RISC V has been added, 32 and 64 bit. I mean, I don't expect anybody to be flying it this year, but it's going to be coming since it's an open set and um, risk thing. The, um, the, the Leon 3 variants there were technically already there. This just makes them available explicitly by name and when necessary turns on the arguments for the errata uh, from, so the compiler knows that you have that CPU model. One of the cool things about the ATSAMV and the QRIQ BSPs is they have a lot of variants. Uh, the ATSAM5 supports every processor in the entire ATSAM-V family. Um, the SMP is well tested on Spark, PowerPC, and ARM, and notice that's not a typo, that is 24 cores. Uh, to show how active things have been, I thought I would make life a lot easier for us by focusing on removing obsolete architectures and BSPs. I removed 50 board support packages, and we are almost exactly at the same number for five that we were at 411 because there have been so many new ARM and PowerPC BSPs. So it is kind of, a, there's always a give and take. So um, it's, it's actually sometimes harder to figure out you want to remove something is because adding something, there's always an eagerness to add it. There's a reluctance to take things away. So we have been making releases on the older branches. Um, 4.11.3 is planned. If somebody is interested, there isn't probably enough fixes on 4.10 to make another release. Um, that's a lower priority activity. If somebody's interested in it, again, you can, you can fund priority because otherwise a lot of things is volunteer driven. I mentioned that we know this is a release we're going to suffer with for, and have to live with for 10 years. We had some cleanup and reorganization planned immediately after the release branch. As soon as we started thinking about this being a long-term branch, we realized we needed to move the files around now or the source code would not look the same in three months, which would make it impossible to backport patches. We don't want it to be, we want this to be easy to maintain as long as possible. That's one of the main development activities left on the code. Um, we also want to remove the, own, the remaining barrier to non-GCC compilers. I don't think we'll get that completely done but we can narrow it down. I think Daniel's got a talk, Hellstrom has got a talk on using LLVM on the Spark. This is one of the things they had to figure out how to get around, um, but I, I, we want to eliminate that so we have other compiler options. There's always things we want to happen. There's many, um, 
We have converted to the Python-based WAF build system for everything except RTIMS proper. That is one of the things that will help do, help, um, it'll help build time, which will enable configuration integration to be uh, enabled easier. Uh, we do have help from the WAF author, who is also the author of BuildBot, so you can kind of see a trend on where we're headed there. There, the PCBSP has been on the wish list for a while. This needs, um, Intel last week announced that legacy mode is going away. So this is a leg, this, the BSP is still dependent on some of the legacy mode stuff being there. Uh, we've got two years and then it won't be there supported in new hardware. So we've, we need to, to have an EFI loader and work with non-legacy hardware. It's kind of halfway in between the two worlds now. Uh, the Pi 3 works. I think Alan Cudmore knows exactly what's needed, but I think the UART is at a different address, and for some reason nobody has tinkered with that, but I think it would be working except for that. The, uh, we need SMP um, x86. Uh, for some reason fell behind during all the SMP development because everybody's more interested in Spark, ARM, and PowerPC. It needs a little bit of work, and the Pi 3 needs someone just to make it work. And uh, to give, Gary Crum always wants the microblaze port, so it's going to stay on the list until somebody bites it off. So, I mean, basically these kind of things only happen when the community <coughs> wants them to happen. So, watching uh, JP's talk a few minutes ago reminded me that we're doing some of the, we have the same goal with a different set of constraints. He has one hardware configuration and he owns everything, but he still wants to do continuous integration as fast as possible, every time, as many times as possible. We want to do the same thing, except we fluctuate around 15 to 18 architectures and say 175 board support packages, and no one owns all the hardware. And all of the tools are in, uh, sometimes the GCC tools are in different, different states. So what we have def done is tried to formal, formally define tiers of how well we think things are working and that also gives us a path to eventually remove something. So tier one is tested on real hardware. And I should say we also have, uh, there's automated build infrastructure for this now that you, that's in the RTIMS tools repository. It's uh, called the BSP, the, the RTIMS tester. It automates running things on hardware. Actually on hardware it uses the uh, GDB interface, machine interface to, if you can use GDB on your target, you can get the RTIMS tester to work. It also automates running on simulators. It'll run simulators in parallel if you've got multi-core. But the key here is that we want people to test on their own hardware and, and to report results so we know what people are using and what state it's in. So when we consider something tier one, somebody is reporting results on real hardware. That way we know somebody's really using it. Tier two is what traditionally has been done by the community most of the time. We test on simulators, it stays working, we know it's in good shape, but we, that's not proof that somebody's using it. The tier three is we know to, known to build. That's where a lot of the things are, I'll pick on one. The 68,000, there's a lot of BSPs in there that are known to build, but I have no idea on a lot of them because we never saw hardware. And I know that some of the national um, experimental physics labs, uh, have the DOE labs have the hardware, but uh, you know until they report on it, I just know it builds. So usually those we used to joke, we assume they work because nobody's complaining. And usually that's the case, they work. Tier four is it fails to build. This is usually a hint that the architecture itself is in trouble because failing to build over a long period of time is usually indicative of that uh, there is no maintainer for the tools upstream at GCC. So like this is a sign that the entire architecture itself is dead. That's usually also a hint to go look and see if the vendor has end of life it. Normally nothing stays in tier four very long. But what we're trying to do is get people, to encourage people to report their test results. There's a public build list. And we've kind of been doing this uh, informally uh, anyway, but now we're encouraging people to uh, test and we've given them infrastructure. So. Uh, Part of that reproducibility is that you get the full RTIMS test suite, now you get infrastructure to run it, and you get uh, a published, building a published database of uh, known test results. 
So there is a build mailing list, there's an RTIMS tester, it's configurable, and uh, there's another script, RTIMS run, to help you run on simulators and hardware. Again, uh, you, on real hardware, you're using the GDB, inter, back end of GDB to do a lot of the work. The idea here is that it's very configurable because every, even if two people have the same hardware, it may not be configured exactly the same way. It may, you may have different automated power control. Um, the script, the, the infrastructure has support for automated testing control. It has control support for telnetting to various boards. So you, I mean, it's trying to, it's a general uh, tester for embedded hardware in, on, on simulators. It's not RTEM specific other than the name for it. So as of a, a week or two ago, that's what people had reported results on. Uh, one of the interesting things is the PC, because of the boot time, I think the first run take, took eight hours to run, but the zinc is on the order of running between five and 600 uh, tests in about 80 minutes. So there's another tier of simulators, um, but there's still a lot to do. So um, there's 12 architectures, a lot of BSP families and 165 BSP variants. And, but right now there's no BSPs with no architectures or BSPs with tier four type problems. So that I'm just trying to help us track it. And as the community tests and report results, this will move up because um, it's just the way it is. Not that this community uses it a whole lot, but one of the really nice things that's happened with our Tim's over the past couple of years is we have implemented the BSD, free BSD device, well it's actually the BSD device driver kernel interface layer with RTIMS, and we can bring over the entire network stack from FreeBSD, the USB host controller, ma removable mass storage controller, and uh, now the Wi-Fi stack. So you can do IPv6, IPv4, IPsec, um, packet filtering, the whole stack. Every uh, network controller that BSD supports should work. Every wireless NIC should work, although right now only uh, the Realtek family has been checked. So this is very high performance. Um, you can do full gig E. Uh, I've seen pretty close to full gig E on boards with two NICs. One of the really cool things is if you, you read the fr or know how to do FreeBSD network con uh, configuration, it is exactly the same on RTEMS. You can just use the free FreeBSD system administrator's handbook and it's configured the same way. It is so full that it actually has open SSL, not OP SSL and we can run TCP dump and other command lines. So it's really pretty, it's pretty amazing that we're running the BSD. And we'll, some people have heard me say we had a BSD developer complain that we spammed him. We are running so close to their code base that we took his uh, Git commits from FreeBSD, put them in our Git unmodified, and it sent him commit emails. So he, he, so he comp complained and we were like, well, okay, that's good, we used your code. So right now the Wi-Fi is in pretty good shape. It's got WEP and WPA2. It has the, the crack patch, the one where it was come out about a month or six weeks ago that's already in the tree. So we are tracking the latest uh, FreeBSD release code from their SVN. So uh, you can use the um, BeagleBone or the AT SAMs with uh, USB. Uh, dongles. The performance is not that great, but anything on the other side of USB is not that great. And the performance on those, even on Linux, is not that good. It's pretty much the same performance. So this is something that people can play with, but I don't expect you to fly it. So part, back to that reproducibility, we want users to have all the source. So it's the source builder. We focused on the dynamic loader with the RTEMS loader. Uh, the coverage reporting has uh, had a step up during, thanks to a Google Summer of Code student. The RTIMS tester is what we're focused on now, which when it, we're uh, increasing the speed and turnaround of the builds and the testing so that the build bot instance can, can go live. So what Hope really would like to see over the next couple of years is, because um, we made progress on these, and these are now need community input. The capture trace engine is SMP safe. And what we need is uh, the implementation of the code to talk to Eclipse, which is an open protocol. And then you can do timeline visualization of our traces. So things are coming along. It's just, it's at the pace of community support and people 
funding developers to, for what they're interested in. The, um, so I pretty much covered this. So the Eclipse visualization for the trace visualization will, will help. So uh, one of the things, and I guess Scott Zimmerich will talk about this probably, I guess, tomorrow, is he's provided recommendations for uh, the software, RTEM software engineering guide. So what he has done after he's listened to me whine and we've talked a lot, is he's looked at the NASA's quality standard and the DO-178, and he has come up with an open source friendly outline of a software engineering guide, and he has figured out what pieces and parts we already had something that would fit that area of the quality standards. And he's given us like hints of where to move content from the wiki or wherever it was into the section in this guide, and then we can at least see what we're missing for some of the other things. We're no, we know we're missing a requirement set, but this will fill in things where an IBNV person like looking for our coding style wouldn't have to dig through the wiki to find it. It would be in a real document called a software engineering guide. So we've taken it from things where we probably had something, but they were too hard to find. So we're starting to move things. And um, there is a qualification mailing list that exists. So um, as I've said, we expect this next release to be long term. So we're hoping that we've made progress on what Scott has, uh, is recommending. So, but at, we will need help because we're not experts. Um, so somebody else has got to help us define the goal. We'll work toward the goal, but we don't know what the goal is. We just know what we needed. So like, like our coding style, we know what we needed to keep the community consistent. That may or may not be what NASA or ESA thinks you should have at, to the level of detail. So, I mean, that's what we need to do. We need to be graded. We've been told what the holes are, what the big plan is. Now we can just fill it in as we go. I noticed I mentioned this last year, but it has come a long way. We have converted from GNU Tech Info, which is what I put the documentation in, in 1994 after it had been at Lotus Ami Pro. Now we're in Sphinx, which is the, was adopted by Linux kernel, I think, in the past year. It's like ASCII doc, but it's a slightly different format. We have um, renamed what used to be the user's guide to the classic API guide, because that's really what it is. There is now a user's manual to help you get started and have more information. So what we're, we've added advice on obsoleted APIs. One of the, which they're not many, they're mostly for SMP related issues. But um, there's one of the things we're wanting to get is um, some more how-tos that are related to BSPs, um, guides to common tasks and problems. Like uh, one of the things that's example is setting up JTAG with GDB on a zinc. That's something a lot of people need help, and it would just be nice to have that kind of documentation available. Uh, one of the new guides is a POSIX compliance guide. There's uh, a number of profiles multiple versions of the POSIX standard, and there are profiles for the avionics community, software-defined radio community, and other communities. Now we have a guide to all of those profiles of POSIX that we know about. So if you're interested of how, conf how close RTEMS aligns with various POSIX profiles, we would now have a manual to give you that information. So generally, the documentation is, looks a lot better than it did under the old. Um, tech info and it's uh, had some significant updates and we're trying to look forward. So we don't mention much about our hosting but I have to throw this out. Our Tim's was hosted by OAR for about 20 from about 1995 up until about five years ago. We reached the point where we needed a hardware refresh and we had an offer from Oregon State's open source lab to host. They gave us a they we have a half rack of space at in their lab it is like our rack is like two hops off the internet to backbone, so it is way more bandwidth than uh, OAR would have ever been able to afford. The key here is that we don't talk about this much, that all the hardware has been purchased using donations. It actually has all been purchased by donations from us mentoring students through the Google Summer of Code. All the sysadmin and maintenance is volunteer, and that's why some of the things um, don't happen as fast as they should. The hardware is about four and a half years old now, although it's still pretty high end, it's aging. And basically this is an underappreciated shared resource that we all depend on. So we just want to make sure everybody's aware that it's something that we have, we have to do. I mean, it's something, 
we focus on maintaining and improving RTIMS, but there's infrastructure that has to exist to make things happen. So I mentioned the POSIX profiles. One of the nice things that's happened over the past couple of years is um, I've been supporting the FACE technical standard, which defines um, a reference architecture for uh, cockpit software, cockpit avionics software. And it defines operating system profiles, among other things. It has a, a data transfer layer that, on, when you look at the bubble diagrams, looks a lot like the CFS data bus. But it, it defines a set of services for POSIX and A-Rink 653. So um, DOS had 25 years of level A time and space partitioning with A-Rink 653 and RMA support, but did not have POSIX support. And we had a similar history with our POSIX support and lots of deployments, but we didn't have the, the A-Rink and the time space partition. So what we've done is integrated the two products and we're offering it on uh, ARM, PowerPC, and x86. And we're in the middle of, hopefully toward the end of verif conformance verification for meeting the safety-based profile for the FACE operating system segment, which uh, means we essentially have this type of architecture where you can run RTIMS para-virtualized in a partition, time and space partition. You can run an A-Rink application or a DS um, RMA application. And you can, in the POSIX partition, it, look, it is RTIMS. It is just RTIMS. And um, although from a phase perspective, there's 280 or 300 APIs that are guaranteed to be there. It is the full regular RTIMS. You can communicate with the other partitions using sockets, shared memory, um, A-Rink 653 queuing ports or A-Rink 653 um, queuing and sampling. That's the word. I was thinking polls, but that's not what I wanted to do. So almost everything that happened, well, everything that happens in the RTMs for improvements are uh, either community, are either done by volunteers, paid for by users. All of the improvements um, come from somewhere. The, uh, like the SMP was a combination of ESA, Canadian space and commercial users. Uh, the FreeBSD work has pretty much been from commercial users. Um, everything comes from somewhere. Um, and it, we wouldn't get better and better and do things. So just please uh, remember when you use this that it, it works easily because a lot of people have been treading the ground before you. So just continue to help us and uh, help the core developers uh, able, make them able to work on it. And if you've got issues with RTIMS, if you want priority, I hate to be crass, but if, you, if you're waiting for a volunteer to fix your problem, you're probably going to wait a long time, if, but if you want to fund a, a core developer to fix it, it will get fixed a lot faster. You can buy deadlines. So in this case, you can buy a deadline. Otherwise, you're asking somebody to take weekend time or time away from their family to fix your project's critical problems. So whatever questions anybody's got, I'm happy to answer, and I've been answering them all week. So. Okay, good. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any more questions or? Okay. <clears throat> Let's do the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for supporting.